much uh, further ado, let me just introduce our first panelist. That will be Dr. Filan Ntembu, who is the Executive Director at the Institute for Global Dialogue based in South Africa. And um, he, uh, he, uh, he pursued a, a joint doctorate program uh, with the Graduate School of Global Politics at the University of Berlin, uh, Berlin in Germany, as well as the School of International Studies at Renim uh, University in China. Uh, the, the focus of this, his dissertation is quite interesting for us uh, because it talks about the, rising, uh, the rise of emerging powers um, as sources of development cooperation in Africa. Uh, and, and we thought that that was important to note for which he got, an, he got um, a magna cum laude award for it. And he has done uh, various publications that look at China and India's development cooperation in Africa as well as um, as well as others. So, without much further ado, I just call upon Dr. Filani Ntembu to just give us uh, his presentation. Uh, presenters will take about six minutes uh, to give us their insights. So, once we have the first four presentations, we will listen from our distinguished guests and then pass on to the Q and A session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I hope you can hear me and uh, see me. Um, <clears throat> I think let me just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus my presentation, I mean, simply around these two questions that you've, uh, you've uh, highlighted. Uh, the first is really the impacts 19 on uh, various groups uh, within the country. And I think in order to get to the impact, I think it's important to understand that already prior to the um, um, COVID-19, is that the region as a whole, and here I'm talking about Africa as a continent, was really one of those regions which were economically growing faster than uh, other regions of the world. In fact, for the last uh, 15 to 20 years, at least six to seven of the fastest growing economies in the world have been African countries. So, I think it's important to, 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 to situate it within that context. That the impacts of COVID-19, whilst in Africa, have not led to the type of health crisis that we are seeing or did see in the initial stages in Europe, um, in the US, and even uh, 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 some Latin American countries it didn't lead to that type of uh, health crisis. So we didn't see uh, hospitals uh, being overburdened, being overrun um, uh, as the, as the, as the uh, COVID-19 uh, spread within uh, society. And that's largely because of the very quick action that was taken by the governments in the region. And I think we need to understand that African countries have been dealing with uh, epidemics and pandemics of various sorts, despite having uh, very limited uh, resources. So in a crisis like this, for instance, where you need to have a very good uh, contact tracing um, infrastructure, it's clear that African countries have been able to draw from their previous experience of dealing with uh, uh, pandemics, whether it's Ebola, whether it's HIV AIDS, whether it's TB, and a whole range of other um, uh, uh, health uh, uh, issues. So this at least cushioned the health impact. However, it did not necessarily cushion the economic impact. And I think this is where really uh, 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 the test is going to be for the continent. It, it's going to be around the socioeconomic impacts. Um, so in, 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 in a country like South Africa, for instance, um, and going right into that uh, first question around some of those vulnerable uh, migrant groups, for instance, uh, that get impacted. We saw this in the first uh, weeks following a strict lockdown. And South Africa's lockdown, I mean, it was commended amongst uh, various quarters, um, but also it, it, it was amongst the strictest uh, in, 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 in the world. And when, we, when in the initial stages, for instance, you had uh, 
the big, you know, uh, supermarkets which were open um, under, of course, certain uh, health measures. And almost immediately it became clear that whilst the formal sector, uh, at least within supermarkets, was allowed to trade, um, immediately you had pressure from below, which was actually raising key questions uh, to the government and was saying that a large part of our population do not only do their shopping in formal uh, supermarkets, they also rely on the informal traders um, to actually get their shopping done. So if you're opening the formal sector, why not open the informal sector, at least for people to be able to get, um, you know, uh, uh, essential uh, goods, groceries and so forth. And it was quite interesting because, you know, following this discussion, because what you saw, at least in the initial stages of the lockdown, is that the formal supermarkets were becoming, you know, very, um, I mean, everyone was forced to go to them. And I think that's when the people realized that actually there's a huge portion of society that, that relies on day-to-day -day shopping from the informal sector. Now, the informal sector is not is significant for this uh, discussion because that is also where um, some of uh, your migrant groups are active in, within the economy. So as long as you had the informal sector um, uh, uh, strictly locked down, you were negatively impacting not only uh, South African traders in the informal sector, but you are also affecting, you know, migrant uh, 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 populations who are used to trading within that informal sector. And then the, the pressure from below, I think, was sufficient enough for government to reconsider and to actually then allow an opening of the informal sector. And I think you know, with time, that's obviously um, been able to ameliorate some of the economic uh, um, damage that we saw um, affecting, you know, that particular sector. So that's one thing that's quite in, in, important in this discussion. But I also think one area for the South African case, which was quite important, particularly relating to uh, migrant uh, communities, um, uh, refugees is the ruling which came now South Africa is a constitutional democracy and so when government um, decided to have a 500 billion um, uh, relief package uh, which would be uh, distributed to different sectors of uh, society um, part of that package was designated for unemployed uh, South Africans. So not only you know those who had been who who lost their jobs as a result of COVID nineteen, but those who were unemployed and had no and had no uh, could not apply for uh, unemployment insurance, uh, uh, for instance, and you know that was hailed. But I think what was interesting for this discussion is that because of South Africa's um, uh, constitutional, uh, or because of South Africa's constitution, um, some groups then appealed to government and said, the relief package should not only go to South Africans, it should also go to, um, uh, to, to, to refugees, um, but it should also go to people with, uh, to asylum seekers, and it should also go with people who have a special permit uh, to be in the country. Now, of course, South Africa attracts uh, a number of, uh, of, 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 of people from the region, economic migrants, uh, refugees. And I think that was a significant ruling because what it actually did is it actually compelled government to ensure that the social relief package 
that South Africa uh, um, uh, was dispersing was not only being dispersed to South African nationals, but was also being dispersed um, to asylum seekers and people with uh, uh, special permits. And often those are also people who are vulnerable uh, within the society. And these are people who have also been adversely affected by uh, COVID-19. So these are some of the measures, I think, which were quite important, but also which had a, a specific impact on um, uh, uh, migrants and vulnerable communities within South Africa. And that came about through the, the court system, which then government has uh, uh, complied to. But I think, you know, closing off. Dr. Filani, that, Dr. Filani I'll just give you uh, one more minute to wrap up, maybe one more minute I, to wrap I, up. I, on I, that I one. just need 20 seconds, not even one minute. Um, Thank you. Sir. So I think a, 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 a key, you know, factor around that, besides ensuring that the social relief package is, dis is distributed to both South Africans and non-South Africans, but I think what's going to be important going ahead is this idea of, uh, of, of, of the informal sector becoming formalized or being incentivized to uh, a, a register with the relevant authorities. And I think this is something that's going to be important moving forward because we've seen the importance of the informal sector. However, there are significant challenges in actually formalizing and getting it registered. And that has a big impact, I think, on the migrant community, much of which is active within that informal sector. I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Filani Ntembu, for that um, uh, very elaborate uh, and, and, and also precise uh, um, information. And I think pointing on to the, info the importance of the informal sector, and I think it's something that um, could... We could, we could well say is could, could apply to most African countries. Um, I, 